Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this Welcome webinar to this organized, organized by BCA. BCA. Yeah. My name is Manti and, and I will be moderating this webinar alongside my colleague Diana. For the benefit of no members, ECIS is a collaborative global network promoting and supporting the ideals and best practices of international education. This web this is the final webinar in a three-part child protection series presented by Katie Rick from Farah and Co. I will briefly go over some housekeeping before we begin. All attendee microphones will be muted during this webinar to avoid background noise. A question and answer session will take place at the end of the presentation. During this question and answer session, questions can be typed into the question box or you can use your hand up symbol to request access to your device's microphone. So over here, you can see the control panel. Here is the hand up symbol, and this indicates that you are muted. If you have a question during the session, you can use the question box, but please note that it will be a part of the question and answer session at the end. A recording of this webinar will be sent to you within the next 48 hours alongside any other materials from the session. I will now I will now hand over to Katie. Katie, over to you. Thank you very much, Mansour. Um, OK, so just moving. There we are. So good afternoon. Um, my name, as Mansour said, is Katie Rigg, and I am a lawyer at Farron Co., which, for those of you who haven't yet seen the first two webinars, is a law firm in London. I'm part of our firm's child protection unit. And we work with international and UK schools and other organisations which work with children, helping them to comply with child protection law and to keep children safe. Just give you a very brief introduction on our work. Um, so this varies widely. We conduct internal and independent investigations into current or historic cases of abuse. We also carry out reviews and audits into schools, welfare and child protection procedures. We advise on the handling of life child protection cases and on schools governance and management structures. And we also draft and review policies and audit documentation and provide training. So moving on to the webinar. As Mansour said, this is the final in a three stage child protection webinar. As you can see from the slide, the first webinar was on safer recruitment. The second was on safeguarding structures, reporting concerns and trips. And this webinar is on governance. And it will look at how the owner or governing body of a school can comply with its legal ob obligations and ensure effective oversight and scrutiny of child protection within their school. As with the other two webinars, I'll be looking at the UK regulations, which are currently amongst some of the most extensive in the world when it comes to child protection and which provide a good model for international schools to work towards. Many of the international schools we work with are increasingly trying to move beyond their national requirements and implement UK standards, and some of these schools are also now being inspected against these standards. So I will start by giving you a, a setting out a sort of very brief overview of the broad uh, different categories of governance, uh, different mod governance models that you find with international schools. I will then look at whether proprietors can outsource or delegate safeguarding. I will move on to um, a case study uh, illustrating the importance of effective safeguarding governance. I will then help you to understand some of the legal obligations which you might be subject to and then look at ways in which you can implement these obligations in practice. And I will conclude by looking at how you can move beyond compliance and towards best practice. So, sorry, let me just, um, oh yeah. Um, so, governance models. Although there are some differences in the legal obligations and liabilities which attach depending on the governance model, the overarching principles are the same irrespective of the model. But it is worth just briefly looking at these models and some schools won't fit neatly into one or the other 
the, uh, this is a simplification, but it, I think it's just quite helpful to give an overview. Um, the first is the traditional model, which many UK schools follow, as many independent schools are also charities. And in this model, the charity or, or not-for-profit association appoints or elects a governing board that oversees the school's governance. The, the board appoints and empowers the principal or director of the school to manage the school, and this principal reports up to the board. The second model are proprietary schools, and these are founded by an individual or a small group of individuals who own the school. These individuals often have advisory boards which play a similar role to that of the governing body in the first example. And individuals may in some cases appoint a representative to act on their behalf. And the final group are groups of schools. The legal entity here is typically a company, although not always, and the legal owner with ultimate responsibility is typically the board of that company. This governance model is more com complex than the other models as one central owner is ultimately responsible for multiple schools. So for the purpose of this webinar, I will use the term proprietor to cover the owner or governing body in each of these models. So can proprietors outsource or delegate safeguarding? Although in practice, proprietors may delegate some of their safeguarding responsibilities. So for example, in group structures, the central body will often delegate some oversight duties to other individuals within the, the owning entity. However, proprietors should always take measures which enable them to satisfy themselves that the safeguarding arrangements in their school are first of all legally compliant but also that they enable the school to ensure the safety and welfare of the students in practice. In reality, this isn't the case for many international school proprietors who often tend not to see safeguarding as within their remit and whose meetings can often be dominated by budgetary considerations. In our view, this is insufficient and is very high risk and this is for a number of reasons. The first is legal. So in most jurisdictions, proprietors will at the very least be under a legal duty of care to look after the safety and welfare of the children in their schools. Most jurisdictions will also have expressed statutory guidance which impose specific legal duties on proprietors. If proprietors fail to comply with these duties, there can be serious regulatory consequences, including forced closure of schools. By way of example, we recently advised a school whose individual governors were subjected to a lengthy investigation by the regulator as a result of a series of historic abuses, abuse cases coming to light. We've also recently worked with an international school which has gone through a long and very serious series of inspections and investigations by a number of different regulators as a result of a sexual abuse case. These bodies included the school inspecting body, the local authority and independent lawyers. The chairman of governors and the owner of the school were both questioned at length in a number of these investigations and the governance structure was scrutinized thoroughly. Each inspecting body tends to have different powers of enforcement and the consequences for the school could have been very serious indeed. Uh, hi, this is Mansour. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We are just trying to get Katie back on. Please bear with us.
once again, apologies for the technical difficulties. We can't seem to be able to get Katie on the line. So uh, please bear with us. Uh, hi everyone, Diana here from ECS. We're still trying to find out what went wrong uh, with Katie. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to you shortly. Please stay online. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're just waiting for Katie now to rejoin the group. If you just give us a couple of more minutes, please, uh, we should be back online soon. Thank you all for your patience. Hi, I'm really sorry about that. We had a bit of a technical failure. Mansour, are you there? 
Uh, hi, uh, Katie. No, Diane is here. Uh, so, yeah, yes, you're back on. Uh, we can hear you now. Yeah, apologies for the technical no, I'm issue. Not sure. I'm not sure what happened there. It just sort of cut out. I'm sorry about that. Um, shall I just take start from where I left off? Yes, please. Yes, if you could. Yes. Um, so, in the school, in the case of the school we were working with, the chairman of governors and the owner of the school were both questioned at length in a number of the investigations, and the governance structure was scrutinised thoroughly. So each inspecting body tends to have different powers of enforcement, and the consequences for that school in particular could have been very serious. Other legal risks are, uh, well, the risk of civil lawsuits where children or staff suffer harm as a result of child protection failings. And depending on the jurisdiction, there can, can in serious cases also be criminal implications for individual proprietors. For example, where gross negligence by proprietors can be shown to have caused serious failings. So moving on to the next category of risk, um, could you, uh, Mansour, could you just move on to the next slide because I don't seem to have control of it anymore. Hello Katie, can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Right, I've given you keyboard and mouse controls again so you can continue. Perfect, there we go. So the next uh, consideration is ethical and this is a photo of a senior teacher in a school in Plymouth who was caught by an undercover officer posing as a 14-year-old girl online. And this just brings me on to the importance, the, the, sort of the, the ethical considerations, which is that the protection of children is an incredibly serious issue, obviously, and goes to the heart of what a school is about, not only in protecting children from harm or abuse, but also in promoting safe and supportive environments in which children can build trusting relationships with staff and lead happy and healthy lives. If a school is unable to protect children from harm, the results can be utterly life-changing and completely devastating. Take by way of example the effects of grooming and abuse. Perpetrators of grooming manipulate their victims over a period of time, sometimes years, gradually gaining the victim's trust, desensitizing and sexualizing them for the purposes of abuse. Victims are taught to respect, trust, and sometimes love their perpetrator and the betrayal of that trust can result in severe long-term tra trauma, depression and mental health difficulties, and even suicide. We worked with a school recently where a member of staff was found to have groomed and abused a student and where that student had been seriously damaged as a result and was subsequently diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. We also worked with a school where a teacher was found to have abused a young girl who subsequently committed suicide. I use these examples simply to illustrate the importance of ensuring the safety and the welfare of the children in your schools. So moving on to the next slide. There we are. This is reputational. So regardless of what your national or state laws say about proprietors' duties, Proprietors are the leaders of the institution. They are the ultimate owners, and they will take ultimate responsibility when things go wrong. Child protection, sexual abuse, grooming, these are all topics which sell newspapers and attract attention. This is a quote from Martin Winterkorn, former chief executive of Volkswagen, which he made as part of his resignation speech last year when it was discovered that the firm had manipulated US diesel car emission tests. Mr. Winterkorn made this statement the day he resigned, trying to prove his innocence. I'm not aware of any wrongdoing on my part. As the public's reaction to this statement showed at the time, as an owner or governor trying to distance yourself from your organization when institutional failure is uncovered is not always a very wise strategy to pursue. In fact, what it can do is highlight significant weaknesses and oversights in governance. So in this example, why didn't the CEO know what was going on? And, and for schools where institutional failure have led to child sexual abuse or emotional abuse, why did the school's governing body not have procedures in place which enabled concerns to be reported up to them? And why were they not aware that students at their school were being abused? These are all questions which will be asked if a school comes under scrutiny by the media. Commercial considerations. 
this is directly linked to reputational, as when a school's reputation is damaged, particularly when that damage is linked to the safety of children, student numbers can plummet. In fact, there was a school in the UK which was forced to close a few years ago as a result of an abuse scandal which led to the withdrawal of a large number of students. The consequence of any legal or regulatory failures can also be very costly in financial terms, as fines are sometimes imposed and legal fees and damage, pay damage payments in particular can be very significant indeed. So the photos on this slide are all of the same man who many of you will have heard of by now and who I've mentioned in previous webinars. William Vahey spent his life teaching at international schools all over the world. In 2014, it was discovered that he had been abusing children throughout his career, mainly by dragging them on school trips. It's not known how many children Vahey abused, but it is known that he sexually abused at least 54 pupils between 2009 and 2012 alone. Following Vahey's suicide in March 2014, an independent investigation led by a child protection barrister, Hugh Davis QC, was carried out. A serious case review was also commissioned by the local authority, which was recently published and which spent 18 months reviewing the UK school's safeguarding and child protection practices, its governance structure and its culture. We acted as secretariat to the QC's investigation, which together with the serious case review, found basic but considerable shortcomings in the governance regime, regime at the UK school. These shortcomings included, first of all, there was a confusion in terms of responsibility for safeguarding between the legal owner of the school and the advisory board, which had been elected. Each thought the other was look, looking after safeguarding. The end result was that the management of the school was not held accountable and that weaknesses within the school's safeguarding systems were not spotted. There was an uneasy relationship between the school and its owner, which meant that policies and regulations which the owner imposed on schools within its group were not always followed by the school and that the owner did not support the school sufficiently, including in safeguarding. None of the board meetings contained any record of safeguarding having been discussed as an issue. This was damning evidence when subsequently Vahey's crimes and the school's failings came to light. And the case illustrates the critical importance of effective safeguarding governance from top and the importance that this has in ensuring the safety of children and the tragic consequences that shortcomings in it can have. So moving on to the legal framework. And I think the previous cases have, they illustrate the importance not only of complying with the legal obligations, but also of moving beyond compliance. Especially in some jurisdictions, mere compliance with your national legal obligations is, is not a particularly high threshold to reach, and it's always important to, to think about moving beyond these. So in the international framework, and I've mentioned this previously, the, the main document is the United Nations Constitution on the Rights of the Child, which recognizes a number of key rights, including the right to be protected from harm and maltreatment. At a national level, child protection law, and in particular the legal obligations on proprietors, are often contained in multiple sources of national and state guidance and are regularly enforced by a multitude of regulators. This can make it confusing and frustrating where there isn't a joined up approach. By way of example, I set out there on the slide the key legal documents in the UK. KCSIE and working together to safeguard children tell proprietors what their legal duties are in overseeing and monitoring school safeguarding systems and what to do and who to approach in each, at each stage of a safeguarding incident. The policy paper and strategy document explain how schools working with school, charities working with children and including schools which are formed as charities must safeguard children from harm and they also explain the charity commission's role in the UK and approach to safeguarding issues. Common law, so schools are also under a duty to look after students as a reasonable prudent parent would and failure to do so can result in liability for negligence. This duty cannot be delegated to third parties and similar rules apply in most commonwealth countries. So I set out on the slide broad charity law principles. Um, they, they do emanate from specific charity commission guidance, but broader application and the five actions listed there on the slide would be sensible steps for any proprietor to take, regardless of whether or not they are legally obliged to do so. 
in the UK, the Charity Commission wants to see that school governors have, first of all, assessed the safeguarding risks that might arise from their school's activities and operations. Secondly, created, developed, and put in place suitable policies and procedures, in particular to handle allegations and, and incidents. They want to see that they've undertaken ongoing monitoring to ensure effective implementation of these policies and taken steps to ensure that both the board and the people working within the school respond properly when allegations are raised. They also want to see that governors have reviewed the school's policies and procedures, both periodically and following serious incidents, in order to manage and mitigate the risk of something similar happening again by making any necessary changes to the school's policies. There's also Department for Education guidance, and I've just set out on this slide the additional responsibilities which are contained in KCSIE and which I've not, I've not really covered above. So the first is interagency working, and essentially the proprietors need to ensure that the school is complying with its duties to refer child protection concerns to external bodies. Uh, such as the police and children's services, and also that it is cooperating and working alongside these agencies. Safeguarding management, so in the UK, proprietors are responsible for appointing a member of the school's leadership team to the role of designated safeguarding lead, which for many of you will be the director of welfare. Proprietors are also responsible for considering how children may be taught about safeguarding, including online. And finally, proprietors in the UK are required to ensure that the school complies with its legal obligations to appropriately vet and check candidates at the recruitment stage. So that's the UK. In terms of um, other jurisdictions, well, equivalent obligations will apply to proprietors in many jurisdictions around the world. As stated in a previous webinar, it's rare for countries to have one overarching piece of guidance equivalent to KCSIE and detailed guidance is often contained in numerous pieces of national, regional or state statutes. This is the case, for example, in Spain and the US. If you're operating in a federal state, it's therefore important to know not only what the national laws are, but also what the state law says. The precise nature of the legal obligations that attach to you will depend on the governance structure of your school and the legal identity of the proprietor. If you're a charity, you should look to charity law. If you're a company, to corporate law. There is often significant overlap between these categories, which can make it difficult for school proprietors to understand and implement their, their obligations. It can also be frustrating when these laws contradict each other, as they sometimes do, or where a number of regulators inspect or investigate the school simultaneously. Many jurisdictions impose positive safety legislation that in turn imposes obligations upon either directors or their equivalents or senior manage managers of companies. So this is another area to look. And the countries where this is the case include Germany, France, <clears throat> Italy, Sweden, Japan, Canada, and Australia. The law in these countries can generally be divided into two categories. The first imposes direct obligations on directors. The second on either a director or a senior manager. The precise nature of the obligation will depend on the jurisdiction. In Germany, for example, directors have an obligation to fulfill their responsibilities. In the Canadian province of Ontario, directors must take all, all reasonable care to do so, and the thresholds in each case are slightly different. The individuals to whom these responsibilities attach and the extent to which they can be delegated also depend on the jurisdiction. In both France and Italy, the company as a legal entity is almost completely bypassed as an object upon which duties are imposed, and instead duties are imposed upon individuals within that company. So moving on to implementation, I've just set out on the slide what in our experience are essential steps for proprietors to take when implementing their legal duties. Step one is to nominate a member of your governing or advisory body, or if you're a group, a senior member of staff within, your, within that group, whose responsibility it is to ensure that the proprietor is meeting and the school is, is meeting its legal obligations. Allocating responsibility to one individual helps to ensure that that individual takes ownership of safeguarding and that information or duties do not fall between two stools. Step two is for the individual with responsibility for safeguarding to carry out a comprehensive annual proprietor's safeguarding audit, which can then be pre 
presented to the proprietor body as a whole, and this will involve visiting the school and asking a series of questions. In carrying out this audit, the role of the proprietor should be to act as a critical friend to identify the school's safeguarding concerns and needs, and to help the school to address these. The most effective audits are those which are not presented or carried out as an examination or judgment of the school, but rather as a helpful exercise, enabling the proprietor to, to discuss possible improvements to safeguarding practice and any lessons that can be learned from near misses or serious incidents. The audit will enable the proprietor to assure itself that the school is discharging its safeguarding responsibilities effectively by providing evidence of legal compliance and the use of effective policies and procedures. And I've just set out on this slide um, some of the specific areas which such an audit could usefully cover. So the first one is policies and procedures, and the questions which the individual carrying out the audit can ask include whether the school has an effective system in place for drafting and updating these policies, who is responsible for them, and how well are they communicated to staff. This can be verified by the proprietor carrying out sample checks of a handful of staff picked at random to test their knowledge of basic procedures, for example, to whom would they report a safeguarding concern. Safer recruitment and sample checks. This can include a review of a random sample of staff files and then any central register of the recruitment and vetting checks which the school has carried out. It can also include a review of the safeguarding questions which are routinely asked at interview and the school's practices in relation to references. A review of staff training is important and should involve not only a check that the key training is regularly being carried out but also a discussion with the staff as to their views on this training and how they think it could be improved. Interagency working will also need to be tested and the individual carrying out the audit should be briefed on any serious instance in cases as they occur throughout the year. And the individual can then ensure that the school's policies and procedures have been followed, as well as ensuring that the relevant agencies have been informed. So going back to our key list, step three is to ensure that as proprietor, your record keeping is thorough, accurate, and up to date. This is important in order to evidence to any regulators or inspecting bodies that you've taken the necessary steps to comply with your duties. The checklist and audit trail can help with this. Accurate record keeping is also key to enabling you to spot emerging trends and subtle patterns of behavior. So involvement by all members of the proprietor. Although it is important with, that one individual takes ownership for safeguarding within the proprietor body, involvement from the rest of the body is also important. Visits by individual governors or other members of the advisory board is an effective way of achieving this. And the checklist that I, I just referred to can also potentially be used as a prompt for these individuals to ask questions during their visit. It can provide governors with a number of important points to discuss and explore and encourage them to talk about different things and particular aspects of safeguarding that they're interested in. The individual experiences gained could then lead to more targeted questions being asked at governor board level which will in turn help to, prove, to improve the level of oversight, scrutiny, and challenge at proprietor meetings. Visits by every member of the proprietor may, may not be realistic in group structures where one company owns a large number of schools, although the safeguarding governance structure of that company should be such that it enables the board members to satisfy themselves that each of its schools is taking appropriate safeguarding measures. This may involve nominating one individual external to the schools to take responsibility for safeguarding at one or a number of schools. There should be very clear and effective reporting lines from the school management through this individual and up to the board of the company. Clear and effective accountability is also key. One way of achieving this is to implement an independent audit system. Um, which crucially is independent from the individual who the proprietor will have nominated to take responsibility for safeguarding. And then finally, yes, so fine balance, let the managers manage. And this is an issue which I've seen crop up often, um, particularly in group structures. And the question is, to what extent should safeguarding be, managing, be managed and dictated from the centre? And how much autonomy should be given to individual schools? So if you take safeguarding policies, by way of example, the advantages of having one template policy for all schools are clear. 
but centralizing this process too much may remove ownership of safeguarding from individual schools, which can be counterproductive. This was one of the problems identified by Hugh, Hugh Davis QC in the William Bayhew Review, for example, and achieving the right balance here is key. So moving beyond compliance, I set out on the slide examples of best practice which go beyond the legal requirements in most jurisdictions, but which we have seen operating very effectively in international schools. Interviews with staff, students, and director of welfare, these are important as they will often give you a much richer picture of the concerns and the areas that the school will need to work on. It's also difficult for proprietors to determine how well their school is keeping children safe and happy without ever talking to the children themselves. Areas, of fo areas to focus on in the interviews include whether the director of welfare has the appropriate authority, time, training and resources to fulfill their role and responsibilities, whether staff feel well supported and whether students feel happy and secure at the school. What, what, if any, concerns students tend to raise and their views on classroom teaching and on social and pastoral welfare issues. So consider opportunities to teach safeguarding. This is not often, although it is in the UK, it's not often in other jurisdictions an, an express legal requirement on proprietors, although teaching children how to identify and manage risks is critical to their safety. And it's an area which, where proprietors and having someone who's sort of outside and independent from the school can really add value to, for example, the schools um, in, in the UK, it's called the PSHE curriculum. So whatever classes the pupils have to te teaching them about pastoral issues. So one example um, is in an area which is sometimes overlooked by schools, but has I've seen been picked up by proprietors is online safety and I just wanted to pause for a minute here to um, briefly discuss two cases we've worked on recently to illustrate the importance of this. Um, so the first is we, we recently worked with a children's home where a teenager used Skype in his room to groom children online and then we also worked with a school where a large number of boys were groomed online by a criminal gang posing as an Italian girl around 12 sixth form boys were sent, mes sent a message on Snapchat. The message attached a naked photo of the girl and asked the boys for naked photos in return. A large percentage of boys sent back photos of themselves. The boys' emails were met with requests for more explicit, fo explicit photos and eventually videos. If a boy refused, he was told that his previous images would be posted online and sent to all of his friends. Many boys quickly became trapped in a web of fear, shame and blackmail and some were forced to perform sexual acts on themselves in front, of, in front of live webcam. And these cases just illustrate the fundamental importance of online safety and the education of children about the risks of online grooming and sexting. So next on the list is anonymous questionnaires. These can be very helpful um, and que questionnaires which ask people about welfare concerns such as bullying and mental health particularly over a period of time, can provide proprietors with a useful tool with which to spot trends and understand the welfare needs of pupils and students. Annual training. So as a whole, schools in which members of the proprietary body receive regular safeguarding training tend to be very well and effectively governed. And then my last point there is know the law and be aware of the legal landscape. So there's no need for everyone at governance level to be experts in local jurisdiction safeguarding laws and in fact it's often better for them not to be and to, so that they can stand back and ask the difficult questions. However, the individual responsible for safeguarding should have a broad understanding of the school's legal obligations and all proprietors should keep an eye out on key legal or political developments. For example, in the UK, the government last year commissioned an independent inquiry into child sexual abuse which is being led by Justice Goddard. These inquiries are becoming more common. The Royal Commission into, into Institutional Child Abuse in Australia is another example. And they can have significant implications for schools and proprietors should be aware of them and respond to them accordingly. The Goddard Inquiry, for example, has given specific instructions to all schools which they need to comply with and be aware of. So moving on to culture, our work with schools, academic research and independent reviews into safeguarding failings consistently and repeatedly show the fundamental importance of culture. 
I've just highlighted on the slide a small number of key components of a strong safeguarding culture which we have been seen be particularly effective. So this includes a supportive and non-judgmental environment. This is particularly important in cases of grooming where the victim often feels an overwhelming sense of guilt and shame and where disclosures are very rare. A culture in which staff are supported and looked after. Teachers are at the coalface of child protection and in order to be able to provide support and guidance to children, they themselves must be supported and guided. Clear communication to staff about what is expected of them is fundamental to a positive and safe culture as are delineation of appropriate boundaries between staff and pupils. Developing or reviewing your staff behaviour policy in consultation with staff can help to achieve this and exactly what is appropriate will depend on the culture within which you are operating. So by way of example, in the UK it would be inappropriate for staff and students to share the same bathroom facilities, whereas in other countries this would be normal and in some countries it's common for schools to place cameras in the bathrooms for safety and this creates other child protection risks which need to be managed. So how do you achieve this culture and how do you define it? Boring things such as checklists, policies and audits are all part of the picture but they're not sufficient. And I just wanted to briefly mention and share with you a story which illustrates this point and which a child protection expert called Marcus Ruger shared with us at one of our seminars recently. It was of a man who had been convicted of child sexual assault and who Marcus interviewed as part of his research. The man had previously worked at a children's home for a number of years where he had been in sole charge of night duty. He then moved on to be a welfare officer at a local authority, which is where he was subsequently convicted of sexually abusing a number of children. Marcus reviewed the case before his interview and noticed that no level concerns at all had been raised at the children's home, which he thought was very surprising because in all other cases he'd worked on, there were at least some record in the file of, of very low level concerns. He thought, therefore, that the culture at the children's home could, must have been pretty bad. But when he spoke to the man, it turned out that the man hadn't abused at all when he was working in the children's home, despite the fact that he'd been in sole charge, unsupervised, of vulnerable sleeping children each night. And when asked why, he said that it would have been impossible, because someone at the home would have picked up on it. When Marcus probed further, it became clear that the staff in the home were so well attuned to the welfare of the children and staff that any slight concern or difference in behaviour would have been spotted straight away. And this is, in my view, one of the best illustrations of a strong safeguarding culture which goes way beyond procedures and checklists. So moving on to my final slide, self-assessment questions. So self-assessment exercises can be very helpful as if carried out correctly, they can be good indicators of how effective your oversight is as proprietor or how effective your school safeguarding procedures are. Questions which proprietors can ask themselves. I've set out a few on the, sli on the slide and these include, so, you know, do you understand the legal regime in which your governing body operates and the potential liabilities to which you're exposed? Are you discussing issues of safeguarding at governing board level? Are the principal and senior management team being challenged constructively on whether they are doing enough to keep children safe? Where your school has had a serious incident, have you at governing board level reflected on the incident and looked at what lessons can be learned and what improvements can be made? Are you aware of trends or patterns in terms of risk to the children for whom you are responsible, and if so, how? And how confident are you that William Vahey wouldn't be recruited by your school and that if he was, he would be discovered? If the answer to each of these is affirmative, then that might well be an indicator that you are actively and effectively overseeing safeguarding and achieving best practice. We have in the past used a uh, very simple self-assessment tool for schools that we work with and this tool takes the school through a series of questions and then rates the school by colour. Um, so green indicates where the areas where the school's safeguarding structures are good, orange is medium and red is bad. It's a very simple exercise and it doesn't require much time at all. But the insight which it can provide and the benefits which can be drawn from it are significant. So if any of you are interested in, in carrying out this exercise, um, please feel free to contact me after the webinar and I'd be very happy to help. And then final, final slide, um, that is my email address if anyone wants to get in touch and a link to our child protection page.
Right. Thank you very much, Katie, for this informative webinar. We now have time for some questions. For those of you who would like to use your device's microphone, please use the hand up signal and try to keep your questions as concise as possible. We're going to look we're going to start by looking at the question box. So please have your questions prepared. We had Grisella, but Grisella's now hand um, is not up yet. So uh, right. So one of the questions for Katie is, how often should the safeguarding committee or pastoral team and the nominated governance governance safeguarding lead meet to discuss safeguarding issues? I'm not sure if you got that. Yes. Um, no, I, it's a good question. So um, how often should the, so yeah, the, the director of welfare or the person with, respon with responsibility for safeguarding within the school meet the individual with responsibility for safeguarding at a governance level? I think that was the question. Um, yeah, yes. So it, it really depends. Um, schools that we work with, well, so sc some schools that we work with who've recently gone through serious incidents, it's quite regular. Um, and the individual with responsibility at the governance level probably visits the school every term at least um, and, and sits down with the designated safeguarding lead and or head teacher. But for other schools, um, I'd say at least annually. So that would be, I mean, it would form part of the governance safeguarding audit. Um, so at the, at, the, at the very minimum, it would be annual. But I think you, uh, if, if possible, um, it would be better to have a sort of biannual, so every six months, um, visit from the, the governor respon with responsibility for safeguarding just so that they keep on top of developments and make sure that, you know, they, and it's also just important to have face time with the school, I think, and to engage with the staff and the, and, and the students. And so if you can do it um, sort of more than once a year, then, then great. So it looks like there aren't any questions from the hands up from the audience. I'm just going to remind everyone that there is a symbol with a hand. If you click on that symbol and you would and you want to ask a question, we can unmute your mic and you can ask Katie directly. We're going to give it a few more seconds and it would be interesting. I mean, I don't know if anyone who's listening is part of a group structure and just to hear from them and because I know that the groups that we work with, the, the practices vary a lot in terms of how centralised their safeguarding is um, and whether they have any thoughts on what, if it's a head teacher, you know, how well they're supported or, or if it's someone from the central body, how they make sure that safeguarding is implemented at each school. We have one hand up, just one second. Oh, it was June and then boss, but then suddenly it disappeared. So I'm not sure whether she still would like to ask the question. Oh, she is there. Just hold on a second. June, we're about to put you, you, you to unmute your mic. So please uh, go ahead with the question. Uh, you're ready now, Thanks. June. Thanks for the information. Um, we're a very independent school in, in uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and at the moment developing a or redeveloping our child protection policy. Um, I'm just wondering if um, if it's recommended to uh, you know pass your policy through um, a lawyer or someone like that to ensure that you have made sure that you have included all the local laws, you know, as we're not always aware of um, yeah. how the laws actually work and what laws are in place. Yeah. I mean, it's a very good question. Um, in the UK, schools tend to have some legal input, um, especially well, when they 
first create a policy, but then also each time they update it because they're so heavily regulated in the UK. So the inspectors will look at and scrutinize the policy and the school can, be, can fail its inspection on the basis of its policy. Um, okay. In Thailand, I mean, I'm not sure what, how heavily regulated they are, but if you find, if they are heavily regulated, then yes, absolutely, you should probably run it past a local child protection lawyer um, to, to make sure that it just ticks all of the regulatory boxes. Um, but yeah. also finding someone who, who, sort of an independent person who can sort of take a step back, who has a lot of experience with policies, just to do a common sense check and also make sure that, um, you know, it covers even sort of not just from a legal perspective, but that it covers all of the areas that it should be um, and that also, can also be very helpful. Yeah, we are working with the local uh, child line for advice. Um, that, that's working really well. It, it's just looking at the legal implications. Um, we're not quite sure how clear they are um, here in Thailand, you know, from our perspective. So just trying to make sure yeah. that they're, they're all gelling together. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think, yeah, really good that you're working with um, with the local child line. So just on legal, I mean, the thing is it might be quite a challenge to find someone in Bangkok who has in depth, who works with schools and, and is a lawyer and knows what the child protection law is. Um, but if you can, I mean, maybe one thing to do is also to, I mean, just speak to other schools in your area and see who they use um, and, and if they run their policies past someone. And, and also from a corporate perspective, where we are a, um, a for-profit uh, organization, so um, from a corporate perspective, would, would you suggest a corporate lawyer as well, so that the, the, the board feel um, that their interests have been... Yeah, well, I mean, one exercise, so the policy review is one thing, but then another exercise which you might want to think about doing is getting some input from a um, exactly as you say, a sort of corporate lawyer who can who can look at what what exactly the legal obligations are on the governance or on the, on the, um, the proprietary body, and and see how you know if they're implementing them and if not, sort of specifically what what they should be doing to implement them because I think it's it's often the law is so complicated in the, in this area and in is in can be found in different areas of law, that proprietors are often very exposed and they don't, I mean, I think if there's budget there to do it, it's a very good exercise to, to just help them to understand what their legal obligations are and, and how they can implement them effectively. Great, I mean, thank you. Not, not at all, and, and just my final thing was if you do sort of most of the things set out in this webinar, you definitely won't go far wrong. Um, so, so that's the alternative, just making sure that even just from a common sense perspective, you're you're um, doing taking all of those steps. Okay, great. Thank you, June. Um, and now over to Manso. Manso is going to read out a couple of questions from our Q and A panel. So um, over to Manso. Thanks, Diana. Right. Uh, one of the questions is how applicable is this information about? Pro proprietary scores governance to, tr to traditional foundation school governance. Sorry, I got a bit muddled there. That's all right. Um, so traditional foundation school governance, is that, um, would, would they have a governing, does that fit into sort of the first category then? Would they have a governing body? I don't know who, if whoever asked the question could just explain. Right, yes, we can come back to that one. Okay. The next question, oh, yes, yeah, she said yes. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so um, absolutely. Um, the I just used the term proprietor, but that just to cover all three categories. So proprietor for the traditional uh, foundation schools, the proprietor will be the governing body. Um, and so the individual governors will each, the governing body itself is, is the entity which is responsible, but within that each of the governors um, have responsibility for implementing the obligations in the same way that um, in a group structure it will be the 
the company board and in a in a school which has been set up by an individual it will be that individual um, and so in in foundation schools it will be the governing body and and um, all of the same principles apply right okay Natalie Epp says thank you for the information provided we are starting to implement this program in our school here in Colombia. Do you have an example of an effective program that has been implemented in other Latin American countries, I guess? Um, so I don't know if it's possible to find out um, what the structure is of that. I Okay, so, so um, I have experience working with schools in a group structure in Chile, um, but but the actual implementation of proprietors' duties will depend slightly, dep you know, um, depending on the model. But I think it's the principles are sort of applicable universally. So it doesn't, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter um, if the school is based in in Colombia or or in the UK or in Australia, um, because the same the same procedures will apply. And so for the schools that we have worked with, where they've reformed their propriet their safeguarding governance they they basically just followed the steps which i set out on the slide the essential essential steps so they've nominated someone with responsibility they've started carrying out an annual review they've got a checklist they've started visits um, and 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 uh, just just followed the, those steps essentially the, the other point i think i probably make is that the cultural, although the same principles apply universally, because essentially what you're doing is just making, keeping children safe, um, and, and, and that remains the same, but, but the way in, the specific way in which you implement them sometimes will depend heavily on, on your cultural context. So in Colombia or in Chile, um, where you have sort of more, slightly different gender roles, um, a patriarchal society, um, which is slightly more pronounced than you would in the UK, that will come into play when you look at issues like appropriate boundaries between staff and students, um, and management structures, uh, and the ways in which people are held accountable, that, that will differ slightly for, for um, countries in Latin America. Right, so uh, it looks like there aren't any more questions. I'd like to thank, on behalf of ECIS, I'd like to thank Katie Rigg for this webinar. And if there are any questions, they can be emailed to webinars at ecis.org and we can forward them over to Katie. Great, and also, you, yeah, absolutely. And you can, um, if you had any questions about either the audit checklist or the self assessment tool, um, or any other questions, in fact, you can feel free to contact me and I will, I can send um, a sort of little article summarising this webinar to you all afterwards. And, I, and also, I, apologies for the technical failing and for rushing through that webinar, I was just conscious of time. Right, no, that was perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Right, so we're going to close up. Please note that after this webinar, Katie and her team will continue to provide resources related to safeguarding, which you can utilize in your school. If you would like to unsubscribe from the emails, there will be an option to do so. Once again, thank you to Katie for presenting this webinar, and thank you all for attending. The webinar will now be closing.